Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a psychological astrologer as well as a clinical hypnotherapist. And I'm very happy to welcome Anthony Lewis back. Hello, Thank Anthony. You. Hi, good to see you again. It would be great this time round to look at this wonderful book of yours. Oh. <laughs> okay. um, Solar Returns. Now, I've read this book about three times, and I was so I didn't feel I needed to read it again before interviewing you today. But nevertheless, I was flipping through it, and I've decided, hey, I could read it again. Oh. <laughs> In fact, I will read it again. Um, so I guess the reason I like it so much, <coughs> excuse me, the reason I like it so much is because it's a very simple guide into the interpretation of solar returns but also it has lots of great information about i guess in a way how they how, how they develop how they evolve and wonderful examples as well so this is um the reason i i never tire really of looking at this book because there's always something there that perhaps didn't mean as much to me the last time and mm -hmm. is jumping out at me this time. But a good place then to start would be to say, what is a solar return chart? Okay. <laughs> well, let me start even before that. <laughs> Saying that I wrote this book back in the early 2000s. And at that time, I was heavily into Rhinus. And as you know, reading the book, he strongly influenced the content of the book. And at that time, I hadn't yet read the translations Van Dykes was doing of Abu Mashar on solar returns. So I think if I were redoing the book today, I would incorporate the whole Arabic medieval tradition, because I think it adds a lot that's not in the book. Uh, the book really starts with Marinus and. Um, so the 17th century forward. And as you know, Marinus was, he felt he was a scientist and that he had to rid astrology of anything mystical or superstitious. So he got rid of much of the medieval Arabic and even the old Hellenistic tradition, the use of perfections or time lords or any kind of astrological measure that was not based in a real-time scientific uh, observation. So I think that is a shortcoming of the book in retrospect. <laughs> On the other hand, I was I spent several years reading through Marinus, uh, going through his examples, and I thought the guy was brilliant. And let me answer your question. Your question and then talk about so what is a solar return? It's a very simple idea that the sun is very important in a person's chart. And the whole idea of sun sign astrology is based on it. And so that every year when the sun returns to where it was at birth is like a new birthday, a rebirth day, a reincarnation sort of. And if we look at the chart for the moment the sun returns to exactly where it was at birth, we can get a symbolic idea of what might the coming year be like, as if you were born again at that moment. So that's the basic idea. Now it turns out, and this is not in the book, <laughs> that when you go back to the Hellenistic literature, Thaddeus Valens had a different idea. And I was actually just chatting about it this morning to another astrologer who was asking about how did Vedius Valens, who wrote in the second century, the time of Ptolemy, um, do solar returns? Well, at that time, Valens was a very religious, spiritual man, and he, astrology was really his spiritual practice. And in his, his view of the world, the sun was not enough. Uh, you needed the moon. Because in mo the most simplistic terms, to produce a child, you need a father and a mother. The father can't do it alone. The mother can't do it alone. 
It's their combined forces, their combined effort that produces this new being. And the solar influence, the kind of paternal influence or uh, the way he saw it would be the spiritual influence. The, the, the actual spirit, the soul, the life force comes from the sun. But the matter that gets shaped into a human being and the, the matter that is necessary for a physical manifestation comes from the moon and the maternal side. And only if you have the two together can you validly talk about a rebirth. And so he came up with this idea. Well, the sun is very important, obviously. So let's look at every year, the period when the sun transits, the sign in which you were born and use the positions of all the planets for the moment the sun returns to its natal position. But for the cusps of this chart, probably for the ascendant and midheaven of this chart, we're gonna look at the lunar return during that month because the, the moon is so important. We're gonna take the, the ascendant of the quote, he called it annual revolution, not solar return. But let's call it the solar return. And instead of the ascendant the sun has when it's at its, old, its original position, we're gonna take the moment the moon returns to its degree at birth, take that ascendant and do a kind of hybrid chart. It's just a fascinating idea. I, I don't know very many astrologers who do it that way, but that was the original method. <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense in terms of the symbology of astrology, the, myst the mystical tradition, uh, the platonic influence with the idea of the soul reincarnating and choosing a moment to come back and choosing a particular ascendant and a particular location of the sun. And so that's a fascinating idea, but that's not what the book is about. <laughs> it isn't, but it is a, a very interesting concept of, yeah. of the two. Right. You can't produce a child without the sun and the moon together. Oh. And so, and so th this person this morning, so why do you think that happened? And I have no idea, but it occurred to me, maybe our society or our culture has been so patriarchal that the, the importance of the mother got diminished and only the father became important because that's very much part of astrology, traditional astrology. But maybe, the, but maybe it's just, uh, there's also been a move in astrology to simplify things and to, to take away, strip away the to have something that's simpler and I guess maybe more cohesive. And I, I wonder whether perhaps this was uh, <laughs> one of those reductions, shall we call them? It could be, yeah. So have you been playing around with this? I played some, but um, it's time consuming. So I haven't had the time to really study it in depth. But yeah. there is one program that came out of the, um, the Robert Smith School and the programmer's Curtis Manwaring. He has a program called um, Delphic Oracle, and that will calculate the Vedius valence form of a solar return. So that makes it easy to look at. Uh, it's quite interesting. It's a different perspective. The planets are all in the exact same positions as we would get in a modern solar return. The only difference is the cusps are different. Yes, the house placings have changed. Yeah. Um, so from your limited experience of playing around with this, what have you, what's your feeling? I think it's a valid chart. It gives a different perspective. Which is exactly what I expected you to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's a bit like arguing about house systems yeah. you know it's valid different perspectives um, different slants on the same mm -hmm. theme so well if you want to play with this very easy just do your regular solar return and then look for the lunar return when the sun is in the same sign at birth and use those cusps with the solar return positions and see how that changes your interpretations it does shift the emphasis around. 
you know, all the aspects are the same. It's just the, the signs on the cusps are different. So would you now, um, because obviously when we're looking at solar returns, we're also looking at the overlay of the solar return chart on the natal chart. Mm -hmm. Would you now be using the three charts, the natal? Well, I've the, played with it that way, yeah. You, so, uh, okay. But, but so, I, well, I don't use all three. Things. What I do is uh, the natal chart is always the fundament. It's the base. So you always start with that. And then you see what are the planets doing this year that's different from what they were doing at birth? And how are they relating to each other currently and in the birth chart? And that's the basis for the interpretation. And then I do the same with the lunar return. Now, all the angles are the same. So the only thing different is planets will be linked to different houses in the solar lunar return, the valence return. Yes, that's brilliant, okay. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting. You, you should apply, try it with your own chart and see what you think. Yeah, I've got a solar return coming. <laughs> so I yeah. think I shall be playing about with this um, very, very shortly. Um, actually, I also like to look at solar returns retrospectively. So I suspect that I shall be looking at my last solar return. Mm -hmm. Yo, yo, I that's like, how you can verify if, yeah, if exactly. it works or not. I don't want to wait a whole year to discover, mm -hmm. <laughs> to find out. <laughs> no, if, if, there, if an important year stands out in your mind, look at the solar return for that year from both perspectives. And they probably will have different ascendants, so that there'll be a different planet ruling the ascendant, and it'll be in a different place in... It might be in the seventh house in one chart and then the ninth in the other. And maybe that's the year you took a trip with a partner. <laughs> so. Well, that brings me to the often debated question of relocating for the purpose of a solar return. So what is it that's valid? Is it the solar return for the place where you live? Or is it the solar return for the great holiday that you've taken somewhere? Well, it's, before? Actually, it it's, was actually, it's actually both. <laughs> and the reason I say that is everything in our tradition, everything begins with the birth chart. That is fundamental. And the solar return is simply how the planets currently compare to how they were at birth. But the birth chart, including its location is fundamental. Everything has to be compared to that. But we also know, and the literature on this goes way back. I've, I'm not sure exactly when it started, but I've read sort of medieval Arabic uh, comments that they will take a natal chart of, uh, and wonder what would it be like if we cast it in a different city? So the idea has been there for th at least a thousand years. If we were in Baghdad and we decided to go to uh, Turkey or uh, Alexandria, Egypt, how would that change things? So the, I, I think the idea historically is that the relocated solar return is basically the natal solar return at the birthplace conceived of as a relocated chart. And what happens at the birthplace is always going to be important because it's the birthplace. And then the relocation clearly will affect things. And you look at how it will affect things by recasting the chart at the relocation. So it's not either or, it's just you're taking something fundamental and then looking at it from a different location to see how it would play out there. Am I making sense? <laughs> you are, but I do wonder because for some people who say emigrate, mm -hmm. there often is no relationship to the birthplace. I would say- But they were born there. 
yes <laughs> but i was just thinking in in my case and i will be one of millions mm -hmm. i have absolutely no relationship with my native country i have very little relationship with my native tongue and I, currently and and also but I, that's not that's been the case since i was eight years old so it's been a very okay. long and i think for those who emigrate as children this is not uncommon and especially as my entire family relocated so there's like mm -hmm. there's almost a void in okay. the place from which i came so i find it very difficult to conceive that a, a solar return from my native place would have equal relevance to the place in which i live i think it does um, and i think if you looked at both charts you would find and what i've found actually i'll speak to my not only for myself, but for people I've done charts for, that some years the native place solar return seems more effective than the relocated, and some years it's the opposite, and I can't tell the difference, so I look at both. And I think this idea, I have no relationship to where I was born, is part of what we inherited from Marinus, <laughs> the whole tradition, we have to be scientific as astrologers. And I think the tradition I got thrown away is there's a non-scientific, symbolic, mystical aspect to astrology. And Vedius Valence, for instance, if he were alive, might say, well, you know, I read Plato and he talks about this good spirit, the daemon, who works with you for to decide exactly where and when and what location your soul is going to come back to earth. And it picks that location because that is the one place on earth and the certain time on earth when you will have a birth chart that matches what you need to have during this reincarnation period of your life. Because your spirit in this idea is going on and on just coming back periodically to earth. I mean, you don't have to believe in reincarnation, but I think that's the theory. And so from that point of view, you with your guardian angel decided up in heaven, I'm going to come back. I don't know. Where were you born? Because <laughs> you want to say or not? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, Portugal. Yes. Portugal. So I, I'm going to come back in this little village north of Lisbon, Portugal on this date at this time. And that's exactly the place and time I need for this reincarnation. It's so important. I'm going to pick just that spot on earth and no other. And so from that point of view, it's not, not part of you. You chose it when you were still a spirit in heaven deciding to come here on earth. And you know, the, to speak scientifically, you know, your parents probably grew up there. And so their bodies and your bodies quite literally were formed from all the minerals of the earth in that spot. So you're carrying your birth, the dirt you were born on with you. It's the calcium in your bones and your teeth, what's there, the fibers in your body that you, they came from the place you were born because you spent eight years there. So your whole body was made up of that earth. <laughs> I like that. I so like just because you went to England doesn't mean, you know, if, if you scraped your bones and put it under a microscope, you'd probably see minerals from Portugal there. <laughs> I like that very much. I, I think there's lots of, of different ways of looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, uh, choose the place to incarnate from but perhaps it's a springboard to somewhere else. Um, that was my first thought. But then I guess I was thinking also about ancestry and mm -hmm. the importance of ancestry at an energy level. And I think from that point of view, it certainly also makes sense. Mm -hmm. The birth chart is important because that's the root of you um, mm -hmm. going back through generations. So there's lots of different 
um, implications here. So I think that that's certainly a, a very interesting concept. Um, yeah. And I like it very much. Um, but another, if I could add, another way that I've come to think of it is that we as humans tend to think of ourselves as creatures with very firm boundaries that maybe extend a couple inches outside of our skin. <laughs> but in fact, if you take a broader perspective, we are, we live in space time. We don't just live in space. So our beings really have an extended, we're like these creatures that extend back in time and go forward in time. And we're actually linked to everything else in the universe. That's the whole point of astrology, that's above, so below. And so we can't separate, and this is a sort of, I guess, what the Buddhists teach, we can't separate ourselves from everybody else. And we happen to be one stream in this flow of time, of space time. And your stream, at least in this reincarnation, starts back in Portugal someplace. And it flows continuously through time. It extends from Portugal over to England and who knows where it will be in the future. But that's all you, that entire stream. You aren't just you now in this moment. You're you that extends back to your birth and probably before birth with what your parents were doing. You were in the womb and in the future. So you're this giant stream. <laughs> I like that. So. I just had this vision of um, children like me who emigrate at an early age, mm -hmm. going off like little boats uh, or little um, emissaries or ambassadors for the place where they came from, um, a rather poetic <laughs> yeah. image. But I like that. I like that very much. Or another image would be if you have a still pond and you put a drop of dye in the pond and you, you can see the dye flow out all these directions. That's you. You aren't just the point way out there. You're the, you start at the point where the drop hit the water and then your being is this entire flow. So, so that's it. how I've come to imagine astrology yeah. and how and why it works well i think it's um it's a very holistic way of looking at it um mm -hmm. and i i really like the idea of bringing in the lunar return and because it's it's like building a puzzle and it's all the different pieces that are being brought in and creating this very intricate picture. Mm -hmm. of, um, <laughs> a very intricate picture of a moment in time. And, you know, when we're, when we're taking photographs, for instance, you know, if we're at a party and, um, and the, there's the center where it's a birthday party and there's the moment where we're cutting the cake or singing happy birthday and there's different cameras going. Mm -hmm. Same moment, but it's different angles based on different perspectives. So I, I, I really like the idea of having the different perspectives on, on, mm -hmm. on this moment in time. There, there is a more modern technique that's similar in which some astrologers look at not only the solar return, but the annual return of the sun moon angle to the original sun moon angle, which sort of get it's the same idea, but looked at from a different way. So you're preserving when were the sun and moon exactly in a certain relationship by aspect. And every year you look at when does that aspect re recur near the birth. So it's, it's not exactly on the birth date, obviously, but it's very close. And it's in the same month that the sun is at birth, but it's when the moon is hitting the same angle it had to the sun. So it's it's kind of the same idea that Betty's Valens had, but from a different, executed a little differently. And there's a name that in the literature that's called the embolismic return. Do you know that term? Yes. Yeah, yes. It's just, so what do you feel? is the 
most practical use for looking at this moment in time? The most practical. The simplest, I think, is the standard solar return. You, when does the sun return to the exact spot? Because that's exactly a year. And in fact, essentially, if you read the old texts, what they did was, and I think what they still do in India, is you just take the length of the year and add it every year to the birth chart or that you don't even buy, need the ephemeris because you know all your solar returns by just adding the length of the year. And then it depends, do you use a tropical year or a sidereal year? In India, they're using the sidereal year, Jyotish. And so the sun will then precess because they're using the sidereal year. So it isn't returning to its exact tropical position, but it's, it's going exactly one year. And in fact, the old books call it the annual revolution, not the solar return. So it's the return of the year. When have you completed exactly one year? And what are the planets doing at that moment? So. <laughs> and in terms of application, so you, you've decided you want to look at your solar return, irrespective of whether you're looking at the, should we call it the box standard return <laughs> of the sun to the place it was born? or whether you are bringing in the, the lunar return as well. So irrespective of what technique you're using, what do you feel is the value in terms of applying this? It can give you an overview of major themes of the coming year. It's, it's that simple. It is that simple. And, you know, in, and I think that's a, it's the same value that any forecasting technique right. yeah. um, is, is there for. How do you look at your solar return every year? I do, but to be honest, I find it very hard to forecast for myself. <laughs> it's, it's such a subjective process. Yeah. It's much easier if you don't know the person, and then you can. You're you know. right. I, I feel the same. That's why I asked yeah. you, do you use this for yourself? Because I, I tend to use it for clients. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use it for myself retrospectively. Yeah, so I do both. Yeah. That's, that's my favorite mm -hmm. use for to, to look back. Um, and, and I also learn a lot from doing mm -hmm. the yeah. um, approach as well. Um, because when I'm looking at, as a forecast for myself, um, I think this is something I, I'd rather trust somebody else with. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because- I think it's very hard, at least for me to read my own chart. And uh, every time I do, I see something different. Uh, so how did I miss that? Or why didn't I understand that? Or what does that mean? I still don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, and it, it's a very peculiar thing because I, I'm not the same when it comes to progressions. I'm not the same when it comes to transits. Other forecasting techniques, I'm even lunar returns. I look mm -hmm. at lunar returns. Yep, lots of helpful information. It inspires me, sets me up. I have ideas. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I look at solar returns and I panic. Well, it's what? condensing an entire year into yeah. one moment, which is a huge amount of information. That's right. And That's then it's, it's sort of hard to get your bearings. What's important? What's not so important? What should I focus on? There's so much material. Yeah, exactly that. So See, that's why I find the the Arabic stuff so help. If you use perfections, you can say, well, I know this, my perfected ascendant this year is such and such a sign. So that will be an important, whatever it means in my chart and solar return. And the ruler of my perfected ascendant will be a very important planet this year. So I have to pay attention to what it's doing 
what aspects it's making. Oh, one thing, I, I think I mentioned this, but one thing I find obviously very important is I always look at the eclipses of the year in the solar return and in the natal chart, because it's the solar return. So obviously the eclipses are very important and they often highlight key issues by house, by the planet that disposes the eclipse, and, and especially if they hit a sensitive point in either chart, a cusp or a planet. And that's, uh... In terms of, let's say you're looking at the solar return as a story mm -hmm. unfolds throughout the year. Yeah. In terms of the unfolding of the story and the pace and the timing, Mm -hmm. would you recommend that people look at it? There's different techniques for doing that. The, the problem is because it's the whole year condensed into one moment, how do you find the sequence of things in the year? Marinus like to look at the lunar return each month and compare that to the solar return and so this is what will be important this month. How does it compare to the solar return in the natal chart? And if there are repeated themes, that's it. That's what you got to pay attention to this month. And that works. I think Ibn Ezra, what he did was this other method of, you just look every month when the sun returns to the same degree, but in a different sign as the uh, solar return. It's the natal, degree and minutes of the sun as it goes through the year, one sign at a time. When it gets to that degree, look at that chart. Um, and there's a method, I think from, I think it's Abu Mashar. Well, I know it goes back to balance. What he does is he, he says, let's start at the perfected ascendant Lord. He looks at the perfect every year. You, know, you start at birth, that's the perfected board that year. The second sign rules the second year, the third, the third year, and it's planet. So you take the perfected ascendant board and then you divide the year up among the, they only do seven planets, sun, moon, and the five planets, among the planets in the order that they appear in the solar return. So that's an interesting way to do it. And each planet has a certain number of days it will rule according to what are called its minor years. And that, that method works. <laughs> so you basically you divide your year into seven parts. Each part belongs to a visible planet. And so each part's like a couple of months long, a little less than a couple of months, some longer, some shorter, depending on which planet you're talking about. And during those couple of months, say it's Saturn, well, you're gonna probably be working hard and whatever Saturn means that your chart's gonna manifest. And if it's Venus, probably you're gonna party a lot or unless Venus is afflicted or, <laughs> and so on. And uh, that method seems to be Valens. And I think Valens used it. Well, it's, um, it's certainly, there's different, many different ways in right, many, many this, um, which is is wonderful, and it, it seems to me that you are itching to write a second part. Uh, actually, no, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> Would be a lot of work, and actually, there's several books that have come out about the technique uh, since then. So I just I, find it fascinating. I was There's being, always more to learn. <laughs> Indeed. I was being hopeful that there was a part two to come. <laughs> um, but, well, I think Charles Obert has written a book on the, the traditional using the uh, perfection method with solar returns. And um, so there, there are other, there, and I think Martin Ganston came out with a book a year or two ago. Um, he well, uses the sidereal zodiac and uh, more he's more of a vedic astrologer well in the meantime 
I highly recommend that <laughs> you have a look at your own book, which is The Art of Forecasting Using Solar Returns. Mm -hmm. and Anthony, thank you so much for your time today. Okay. If people wanted to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, I'm on Facebook, um, and I have a blog called at WordPress, Tony Lewis WordPress. Okay, good. I shall be putting a link to that in the description box for this interview. Anthony, thank you once again, and thank you all for watching. If you want to learn more about astrology, of course, do please check out my own website, as there's always something going on, not least of which uh, monthly new moon guided meditations. And until next time, have a great week. Mm -hmm.